My wife is my fact checker, and she stepped over and told me, you didn't finish one of the stories. We actually refunded a couple of people's donations last week for the relief because they gave specifically for the fuel tank, which was going to cost us about $500, and, um, and then there was somebody that was going to fill it up. That was going to be like $900, so we let them know that uh, to sit on that and hold it until we got ready to do something different, so we gave those funds back. And I just didn't finish that story, which is kind of what happens when you get too much on your plate on a Sunday. But we're glad to be here. You guys look great. Any dreamers in the room? Amen. Any believers? Any achievers? Yeah. All right. At the beginning of this series, man, it's been great. I want to thank the small groups that have stepped up and participated so well. You guys are phenomenal. And you're building Christian community, and that's awesome. Over 300 people every week have been in small groups during this series, and that's going to be able to, to con continue if you so choose to stay with your group. But at the beginning of this whole thing, this church-wide campaign to encourage you to chase your dream and find out what God has put in your heart, uh, my plan was to help you discover God's dream for your life and, and then try to help you simplify you know, a plan, a map, to see it through and to make it happen. happen. And about halfway through this series... I began to realize that I was trying to answer every question that God wanted you to, to trust him in faith for, and that I just couldn't answer all the questions. And I, I kept getting uh, a lot of those questions, and I thought, wow, what I've tried to do is take the second word out of the equation. What is that? Believe. And uh, you can't factor out faith when you're trying to pursue God's plan for your life. Uh, to believe is to have faith. I wanted to give you five or six rock-solid, simple steps to discovering God's dream and, and to see it become active in your life. And there's just no cookie-cutter sermon that will give all of that to you. And I realized if I could do that, faith wouldn't be a factor. And you could just check those five or six boxes. And, and, and I can't open doors that only God can open, okay? So faith is always going to be a part of this. And part of living God's plan for your life is having faith that he's going to open the right doors at the right time, and you'll be bold enough to take those steps, even when you're, you're not sure what might be waiting on the other side, okay? Uh, there's not enough sermon material in the world to take the element of faith out of God's dream or his plan for our lives. You're going to have to live in faith. We're called to believe before we can achieve, okay? The title of the sermon today is Believe It and Achieve It, and uh, it's so important. Faith will always be a factor in God's plan for our lives, Okay? And uh, I think it's going to be something we have to understand. So I want to send you, I'm thinking, what am I going to do to finish this series? And what am I going to say? What's important? I have got a lot to say today. I said it in 36 minutes in the last service. If you say amen, it makes me preach faster. Amen. There you go. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much. It's just, it's just what I have to put up with. But uh, we, you know, I want to send you out of here today with confidence uh, that the journey we have begun together will, will take us through many doors that God's going to open for us. Our memory verse is Revelations 3 and 8. Can anybody quote it? I have set before you. Y'all cheated. Yeah, y'all cheated. The Bible tells us that God spoke to Joshua and he said, there's the promised land. They were standing on one side of the Jordan looking over into the promised land. God said, that's it. That's my plan for my people. That's the promise. I want you to go in and possess the land. But Deuteronomy chapter 7 tells us there were seven enemy nations occupying this land. And each one of them were larger and stronger, had bigger armies than what Israel, who was about to possess the land, had uh, you know, with them. So to possess God's dream, his plan for his people, they were literally going to have to defeat seven major armies. Even the land of promise had its problems. But if God calls you to it, he will see you through it. Amen. So he gave Joshua a strategy for success. Now, while I can't define your individual dream for you and tell you how to, you know, to map it out, I can help you put a strategy for success in place so that you can believe it and achieve it. 
The word success is used twice in Joshua chapter 1. In verses 7 and 8, we find the promise where God says, uh, if you do what I have said, I guarantee you're going to have success because I'm going to bless it if you follow my commands. God has a plan for our success, and he wants us to follow that plan. So let's jump right in. Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all of these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give them, the Israelites. In other words, this is graduation day. This is it. You're about to receive the promise. You're about to go and possess the land. They're getting ready to go into that land for the very first time. Verse 3 said, I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. Then he gets very specific. And and he defines exactly the land, the parameters of the land that Joshua is about to to take control over. Verse 4, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. Now, there are five principles that you find in, in Joshua's book, in this histor- historical document that, gave, that God gave to Joshua, and they are the same five principles for success that you and I can map out today with God's favor and blessing as long as we obey his word. Number one, let's start right there. Be clear in your direction. Be clear in your direction. This is the starting point. God specifically outlines the what, when, where, and the why. God said, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. You need a a clear-cut goal, not a vague goal. You need a precise idea, and you got to answer this question. Where am I headed in life? What am I supposed to be doing? I talk to people all the time who will tell me over and over again, PT, I just don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I just don't have any answers. I don't have any any clue. And so as I begin to poke around and ask questions, uh, I quickly realize that they have a lot of noise in their ears, in their life, a lot of distractions that's keeping them from focusing on what God is wanting them to do with their life. You know, we have an exhaust fan in one of our bathrooms at home that should have been replaced about seven years ago. Okay, it just continues to get louder and louder, and, and uh, for some reason, I haven't pulled it out of the ceiling and fixed it, and uh, I just replaced a fan that needed to be replaced for the last 15 years, so it, it happens sometimes, but uh, that, that fan in there has gotten so loud, and if I don't um, really work on it, when Sylvia, you know, I'll hear her voice from the other room telling me something that sounds important, but I can't make it out, and the thing about my wife is she's, she doesn't yell. I know that surprises you, but she doesn't yell at me, okay? Uh, She's not that kind of person. So I'll say, you know, standing in the bathroom, I'll say, I can't hear you. Well, she doesn't come in there and then try to yell over the noise of the fan. I figured out she ain't coming. She's waiting on me to cut the fan off or to step away from the noise so she can finish what she wanted to say, right? And I want to tell you something. It works the same way with our Heavenly Father. God will not scream at you over the noise that you allow in your life. He will not do it. He will wait for you to silence the noise or either to walk away from it before he speaks into your life. He's not going to compete with the noise, my friend. He just won't do it. If you don't know what to do with your life, it's not because God doesn't have a plan for you. He does. You're just not tuning in his voice. Silence the noise. Silence the distractions. You will never discover God's dream for your life if you value the noise more than you do his voice. If you have ears to hear, pay attention. Matthew eleven fifteen. 15. Now, God, God wants us to know where we're headed, and, and he's talking, but we're often too distracted in this culture. I'm not going to get into all the things that distract us. You can figure it out. There's many things that keep us from spending time with God and hearing his voice. There's all kinds of stuff. This isn't that sermon, and you guys are smart enough to know what noise is keeping you from fellowship with God and hearing his voice. Pay attention to the noise and silences. I want to say to our small groups, congratulations. This Tuesday night, you're going to have finished six weeks getting to know each other and meeting new people and and creating Christian community. And every week that you've been in that small group, you have literally taken an hour or longer out of your life to silence silence the noise, and to dive deeper and hear the voice of God. God honors that kind of commitment, and he always has something to say when you tune in to hear his voice. God's second principle for our success, pursuing his dream in our lives is this. Be confident in your dream. Be confident in your dream. Help me preach this. Look at somebody and say, be confident. 
Typically, here's the thing, and you need to understand this. Typically, once you receive a God-given dream, a plan that he's laid out for your life, you begin to doubt it or question it almost immediately. Almost immediately. Is this really God's will for me? Does God really want me to have this? Do I really deserve it? Or, or is this just a selfish request? And what's going to happen? What's the consequences going to be if I'm absolutely wrong? So you start second-guessing yourself. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Yes, you need to be clear in your direction and be able to hear God's voice, but you also must be confident in the dream that God has spoken into your life. We finally silence the noise so we can hear his voice and gather the details of his dream for our lives, but then it always happens. We start having doubt to settle into our minds. You've got to have confidence. You, you have to believe that God has a plan for your life, and you've got to be confident in your dream. This was Joshua's struggle, okay? It was Joshua's struggle. He felt inadequate. inadequate. Uh, uh, God keeps having to, to pump him up. There's this incessant, constant pep talk that God has given to Joshua, and you see it over and over throughout the narrative. In verse 6, God says, hey, man, be strong and courageous. What's your problem? Step up. In verse 7, God says, wait, be strong and very courageous. And then there's another reminder just a few verses later. God says in verse 9, be strong and very courageous. I told you once, I told you twice, and then I'm going to tell you the fourth time. Be strong and very courageous. What's the problem, Joshua? Step up. Four times God says, come on, man. Be confident in the, in the dream that I have given to you. The literal translation of this in the Hebrew is laid out in the Good News translation, which says, be determined and confident, Joshua. In other words, believe it and achieve it. Believe it and achieve it. Why say it four times? Listen very carefully. It's fear that keeps you wandering in the wilderness of your life. It's fear that does it, not problems. We all have problems. I got problems, you got problems? We all have problems. This, this, this church is so well informed. We all have problems. It's fear that says, uh, you know, that, that, that I can't do this or that I, I've got to find another way or can I do this? You see, and I, I think it's important and I think it's, it's powerful for us to understand. The promised land held problems for Joshua. And, and it's such a parallel to what we're going through in our time today. The, the wilderness wandering Israelites, they had problems that they had to get past. And again, let me remind you, there were seven enemy nations occupying that promised land. And every one of them had a bigger army than what Joshua was leading into the promised land. But God told Joshua, drive them out and possess the promise that I have given to you. Someone pushed back in the, in the you know, in the in the army that was kind of in the leadership position, and they said, but Joshua, there are giants in the land. The sons of Anakim live there. It's believed that Goliath was a descendant from the sons of Anakim, and many Bible scholars estimate that Goliath was somewhere between, in, between 9 and 11 feet tall. Uh, if you've got a bunch of warriors to fight that are as formidable as Goliath, it's going to be a, a problem driving out an army that's that massive and that powerful on the battlefield. There's always going to be problems. There's always going to be problems, but it's fear that keeps you wondering with no clear direction in your life. you got to be confident in God and his ability to do incredible and great things through your life. When you're committed to doing the will of God, he will guide your steps. That's his promise. I can't give you the steps that God wants to, you, know, you to get from him. So it, I wish I could. I just can't. Uh, and, and you're not going to receive direction from God if your fear is louder than your faith. You can't allow fear to dominate your days. You've got to be clear in your direction, hear God's voice, and confident in your dream, trust God's provision. Now, there are are typically three things that rob us of our confidence. Number one is bad experiences. I've heard people say, well, you know, PT, I tried that. It didn't work. Never going to do that again. It it hurt too bad, uh, so I gave up on it. Aren't you glad that there are other great historians that didn't give up on their dream? I mean, think about it. Thomas Edison's teacher said he was too stupid to learn anything. He was fired from his first two jobs for being non-productive. As an inventor, Edison made 1,000 unsuccessful attempts at inventing the light bulb. A reporter asked him, how did it feel to fail 1,000 times? Edison replied, I did not fail 1,000 times. The light bulb was an invention with 1,000 steps. Man, when you've exhausted all possibilities, remember this. You haven't. That was an Edison quote, amen? Never let a bad memory ruin your future. 
And a lot of people give in to that. A bad experience will rob you of your confidence if you let it. Don't let it. Number two is emotions. Out of control emotions will rob your confidence and cause you to make horrible decisions. Am I telling it right? Listen, most people tend to make decisions based on their moods. Don't poke nobody. I believe there are certain times that you should delay major life decisions. Don't put them off indefinitely, but delay them until you regain control of your emotions. If you make decisions when your emotions are out of control, you're going to make dumb decisions. I mean, some bad ones, and it'll, it will absolutely destroy your confidence. Don't make a major decision. I'm going to give you a little map here. I'm going to get, I did a little homework for you to try to help you to know when you, when you should not make major life decisions. Don't make a major life decision, number one, when you are hungry. <laughs> Don't make a decision, a major decision when you're, when you're hungry, your mind and metabolism do not, they're not working very well. That's a scientific fact. That's not just something I made up. One of the costliest mistakes you make, and I think I'll get a lot of affirmation on this, one of the costliest mistakes you make, and some people make it every single week, is to go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Yeah. Am I telling it right? Yeah. Don't do it. it. It's estimated that you will spend 30% more at Harris Teeter, yeah. when, not just because they're higher than everybody else, but 30% more at Harris Teeter when you're hungry than if you go after you just ate a ho-ho. Yeah. So get you some little Debbies and then go shopping. I'm just saying. <laughs> Second word I want to tell you that you need to factor in before you make a major life decision is angry. Don't, don't make decisions when you're angry. When you're angry, your mind is reactive and clouded with irrational emotions that's going to lead you to make decisions that you will regret. Anybody ever been there besides me? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, don't make them when you're lonely. When you're lonely. When you're lonely, you're, you're needy and you're vulnerable. Years ago, and nobody knows this person, so, and, and this person has lost contact with us, and they've moved way far away, but, uh, and they can't be watching because it's not working. Uh, but years ago, <laughs> I feel completely safe to tell the story. <laughs> There was a young, a young mother that attended our church we thought a whole lot of. And uh, her family was a very small family, but they came to church and, and found Jesus here. And, and she got blindsided. Uh, her husband had been cheating on her. And uh, all of a sudden, he's just gone and walked out on her and, and her child. And she was devastated. She came in and talked to Sylvia and I, and she was just broken. She didn't know how to pick up the pieces and to move on. We counseled her, and we talked to her. You know, uh, your best days are not behind you. God has a plan. You just got to walk it out. Two weeks later, she walked in the church holding hands with another guy. Two weeks. I looked at Sylvia. I said, you are a horrible counselor. <laughs> horrible. I didn't really say that, but I thought it. I thought it. Anyway, um, bad time to make a, a decision is when you're feeling lonely and abandoned. You need to let the emotion settle down. And then the final one I'll share with you is tired. Don't make major life decisions when you're tired. Before my daddy passed away, I would often call him with a problem that I felt like I needed to move on right away or it was going to get away from me. He'd listen, and more times than I can remember, he would say, son... Sleep on this. You don't, have to, you don't have to make that call tonight. You don't have to do it right now. Get some rest. It's still going to be there tomorrow, and you'll be better prepared to deal with it after a good night's sleep. Maybe take a week, you know, and, and just wait it out and let the emotion of it settle down. I've made some horrible decisions when I was tired. Anybody else? I mean, just horrible. I should have waited until I was rested. So let me, re let me remind you. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired, halt! I thought that was very good. I thought that was really good. Thank you very much. Don't do it. When you get there, just halt. That's a great acronym to remember. The third thing that will rob your confidence is excuses. Rationalizations or justifications, things like, I don't have the time, I don't have the money, I don't have the ability, I don't have the energy, I don't have the education. All of those things are excuses. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So don't make an excuse, make it a prayer request. Make it a prayer request. God's third principle for our success when we're pursuing his dream for our lives, here it is. Be committed to your decisions. 
man, this is good preaching. I don't know if y'all realize how good this series has been, but this has been good. Amen. It's been good. Be committed to your decision. That means once you have started, never, ever look back, okay? Luke 9, 62 says, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of heaven. Don't look back. I had an uncle, his name is John, he lives in North Mississippi. He used to farm thousands of acres of land. And when I was about 16 years old, we were up visiting Uncle Johnny and we went out onto the uh, farm with him and he was getting ready to plow his fields and get ready to plant seed for the first time in that season. And I noticed that nobody had stakes put up, nobody had popped any lines, there was no indication of how he was going to pull straight lines. And he had already plowed some and I'm, I'm thinking, man, how did he do that? The, the, the lines are so straight. And so I asked Uncle Johnny, I said, how in the world are you plowing lines so straight? And he was like, well, just watch. And so I, I kind of stood behind the big old tractor, a big farm equipment as he took off. I'm talking about it looked like a mile across there. And he, he plowed a perfect line. And I watched him do it over and over again to this massive hundreds and hundreds of acres was plowed and they were ready to, to plant seed. And at the end of the day, I said, Uncle Johnny, how'd you do it? He said, it's very simple. He said, you focus on one thing all the way across that field. And you don't never look to the left, you never look to the right. You keep, he said, if you get ex distracted to the right, your, 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 your tractor's going to veer to the right. You're going to have bobbing and weaving in your rows. He said, you've got to stay focused all day long when you're plowing rows. And I came to tell you today, a lot of people in the room, you got all this noise going on in your life and you're being pulled to the right or being pulled to the left. And God is saying, I am the author and I am the finisher of your faith. If you will get your eyes on me and stay focused on who I am, I will help you get to where you need to go. Can I get a witness to that? Amen. Amen. So be committed. Commitment's the key to accomplishment. God said, Joshua, don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Stick with it. Hang in there. Be committed to your decision. Now let me ask, what are you committed to? What are you committed to? A lot of people today are afraid to make commitments. As a result, they suffer, they suffer a high levels of of stress vocationally. You see people that never hold a job. I mean, every year they're, you know, they're changing jobs like I trade trucks. That's not good. There's a story behind every one of them that I'm just not happy to tell. But anyway, but as a result, they're, they're struggling vocationally. Uh, they change jobs often or relationally, okay? Uh, years ago, this person does not come to our church. They cannot be watching online. Uh, and Sylvia come in my, my office to make sure that I was talking about the same person after first service. I said, they do not come to church here anymore. So, and they can't be watching today. Here we go. So I'm safe again. But I like this guy. And, and every now and then I'll still see him uh, out and about. But he used to bring a different girl to church with him every Sunday, Literally. And I couldn't ever, I mean, I got myself in trouble because I'm like, dude, every week it's a different girl. And he just smiled like it was a badge of honor, you know. And, uh, and he liked blondes a lot. He really liked the blondes. And so one Sunday I thought, you know, this girl stayed and she, she, she you know, she'd been there for a few weeks, I found out at, during the break. But, uh, and she actually stayed on at our church for a little while. And uh, I made up my mind. I said, I'm going to get to know this girl. I'm going to learn her name. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remember her. And so I told her in a conversation, I said, when you come back next Sunday, I'm going to call you by your first name. He came in the next Sunday with a different girl on his arm. She also was blonde. I remembered the name and forgot the face. It's one of the problems of being really, really busy on Sundays. It didn't go well. The fact is this, though. A lot of people have problems vocationally, relationally, settling in and figuring life out, okay? The fact is high achievers make decisions, and they, they make a commitment and stick to it. When success comes, they celebrate it. If success stalls, they own it. Diagnose the problem, fix the problem. Here's, here's something that I, you know, I thought about when I was trying to help you understand the value of commitment. Anybody ever been to Universal Studios Orlando? Anybody ever been on The Incredible Hulk? ride, the roller coaster. It's a, it's a ride from hell, just to tell you <laughs> a little bit about it. I've ridden it one time, never got back on it. Uh, it's been around for about 22 years. There are signs as you're going up to get on the roller coaster all along the way. The, the lines are usually very, very long, even with a fast pass, it's usually very long. And it'll say, if you have this problem, and then it lists all the potential health problems that have existed in the, since the beginning of time. <laughs> if you have any of these issues, 
uh, do not get on this ride. So, so many chances to get out of line. They got little doors, you know, exit doors that you can go out and, and get out quickly. But at some point on the Incredible Hulk ride, after you sit down on the roller coaster, after you buckle up, when that harness clicks down over the top of your head, you, you, you riding, okay? <laughs> they don't care how much you scream and holler. Once it starts moving and that click is done, you're, you're, you're riding, right? Because I was screaming and hollering, you know? I don't really, I'm not sure. And uh, my kids was riding it over and over again. I was one and done. But I, here's what I remember about that. They, they have the highest point on that roller coaster is 110 foot high. And it's that first big incline. And it's 107 foot to the top of the coaster. And then you're another three or four feet sitting higher above that. So you're 110 foot up in the air. And the first drop is just about a straight vertical drop. And it is paralyzing. It is, I mean, it is just horrendous to fall that far that fast. And, but finally, you know, you're, you're all in. You, you now know and realize what it means to commit to something you're not really sure of and you've got a little bit of doubt. And you hit the bottom of that coaster and you go, you know, the bottom of that first hill and you go, oh, thank God I survived the worst of it. No, you haven't. <laughs> There's still struggle coming. Let, let me explain that. There are seven, I looked it up, seven inversions, including two corkscrews and two subterranean trenches that you still have to survive. There was a reason they listed all those heart problems and all that other stuff, get off this ride. But sometimes, you know what I found out? Sometimes, even though it's scary, life as scary as life can be, sometimes you need to commit and see your commitment through, no matter how scary it is. And, and quit allowing the devil to get between your ears and create all kinds of noise and distraction. God said, I will see you through it, but you've got to be committed to the dream. You've got to be committed to what he is calling you to do. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Sylvia and I visited the small group uh, hosted by Gary and Sierra Merrill this past week, and we had a full group there. It was a lot of fun. Uh, in our discussion, I told the group once I make up my mind about a tough de decision and I follow through with it, I've committed to the outcome, whether it's a good outcome or a bad outcome, as long as I know I did my very best to do the right thing. I can live with the consequences, whether people get upset with me or, or whether they love me unconditionally. I, I'm pretty, pretty happy once I commit and I did the best that I could do. Look what Joshua did, chapter 3, verse 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. That word consecrate there, uh, that means an act of total, unconditional, unreserved commitment. It means laying it all on the line, going for broke. They're in essence saying, God, we're going to do this even if we fail. We're all in, even if we don't survive it, even if we fail. And God says to every one of us in the room today, this is a commitment that I will bless. Because you're going all in without knowing the outcome. And God says, I'll take care of the outcome. You just need to go all in. He says, believe it and you'll achieve it. Now, some of you are struggling. Some people struggle in relationships. Some people struggle in marriages. And uh, I shared this in the first service. But years ago, I had somebody come in my office. Uh, and after about 10 minutes in, the, the, the lady in the marriage, she said, you know, PT, I, I didn't have much hope that this marriage would work when I said yes. But I thought I'd give it a go. And it, it, it floored me. I'd never heard anybody say that before in marriage counseling. And I'm like, huh? And she said, yeah. She said, I, you know, I just didn't have many other options at the time. Golly. And, and I'm thinking, wow. She came into this thing with low expectations and no commitment. No commitment. If it don't work, I'll just check out and start over again. All couples have problems. Let me say this. And if you're a couple in the room, you should give some amen on this. All couples have problems. Amen. Amen. But the ones who say, we're going to work on this no matter what, those are the ones that go the distance. Couples who stay together don't have less problems than couples who don't. Most of the time, they're just more committed to the relationship. There's only a few times in my ministry that I've ever told somebody, you need to get out of this situation because there was a physical abuse or some crazy thing that a life was being threatened or something like that. But most of the time, the problems that people give up on are problems that other people work through. And there's something to be said for that. Some people have just got to get some staying power and trust God to ride with them through the storm. In my 38 years as a pastor, this is some deep theology I'm fixing to throw on you, I have identified the top three things that make people want to give up. Number one is problems. Number two is pressure. Number three is people. 
It doesn't matter whatever issue you bring up, whatever issue you raise, they can all be categorized into one of those three categories 100% of the time. Problems, pressures, or people. Wouldn't life be grand if it weren't for people? Yeah. Again, God's principles for our success pursuing his dream, let's review. Be clear in your destination, be confident of your desires, and be committed to your decisions. And finally, number four, not finally number four, but number four, be corrected by your defeats. I'm going to slow the train down a little bit. I'm trying to preach fast so I don't go over, but you need to get this. Last service, online is gone. We got nothing but time. Learn from your mistakes. Chapter 1, verse 17, God has given Joshua a pep talk. Again, he says, be strong and very courageous and be careful to obey all the law of my servant Moses gave you. Don't turn from it to the right or to the left. You need to focus and quit getting distracted right or left. Don't get off track that you may be successful wherever you go. Be careful. Don't get sidetracked. When you make a mistake, don't get off course. Mistakes are a part of life. If you blew it, welcome to the human race. We've all blown it at some time. We've all made mistakes. We've all sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Successful people learn from their failures, their sins, and their mistakes. Edison said again, great quote from him, said, don't call it a failure. Call it an education. If that's true, some of us are highly educated geniuses in this room. In chapter 7, we read about one of Joshua's most embarrassing failures. And I wish I had time to unpack this a little more, maybe in another sermon. But he and the children of Israel had gone into the land of promise, and they had won many, many battles. So they got to feeling a little bit haughty, like they were doing something instead of God was doing something through them, right? So they come up against a little town called Ai with just a couple of hundred people, population. And the people of Ai literally kicked their hiney, sent them running. The little town sent them running like scared little chicken hawks, is Lennox's quote. He loves that. They, they conquered Jericho, which was the, the most fortified city in the country. You know, as the walls came tumbling down and they were able to, to defeat them. And they, have you ever seen a football team, for example? They have a big game and they, they play against like a number one and a number two team and they beat, you know, they win and it was a tough fault battle all the way to the end and then the next week they play a team unranked and get beat. That happened twice last year to major teams and and then they play a no-name team and just get beat and that's kind of the attitude that the, the army of Israel was having. We just beat Jericho and nobody can beat us and then a town of 200 defeated their army and sent them running. And and this is such an embarrassing defeat. And Joshua falls on his face and he cries out, what's happening, God? You brought us through the Red Sea. You brought us through the desert. You brought us through 40 years in the desert to the promised land. We defeated great armies. And now some little two-bit town of 200 people is going to embarrass the great army of God. And isn't that the truth in life sometimes? It's the AIs of life that often beat us down, not the Jerichos. We can win the big ones and then we let the little ones sneak in and virtually knock us out. It's the little things. Joshua 7, verse 5. Then Joshua tore his clothes, and he fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord and remained there until evening. He's praying, and he's weeping, and God comes to him and says, Joshua, shut up. Just shut up. I I don't want to hear your incessant whining anymore. Look at verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing on your face, man? This is embarrassing. Get up off your face and do something about it. Verse 11, God said, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant. God told him there's sin in your camp. And we, we know that one man named, named Achan had kept some uh, spoils of war for his own personal profit and hid it under his tent. And that was a violation of their covenant with God. And God withdrew his blessing and his favor from him. And they got beat by Ai. Joshua got up, he found Achan, and he confronted him about the sin, punished him and his entire family. Did you know sometimes your sin doesn't just affect you, it affects everybody that you love? And that's why you need to be careful to stay in line with God's will for your life. But God began to bless them again with great victories. What's the point here that I'm trying to make? When you have been defeated, whenever you have failed, when you've made a mistake, seek out the cause and take the appropriate action action. That's what made Joshua a very, very successful person. Great achievers know how to do two things very, very well. Admit when they're wrong and number two, do something about it. Don't just fall on your face and cry cry about it. Get up and do something about it. They learn from their mistakes. Failure is not the opposite of success. Failure is part of the journey to success. You're going to learn more from your failures than you will ever learn from your successes. I've told my my kids, Mike and Marissa and, and even Josh and Steph, I've said, look, 
I don't want you to make the same mistakes in your life that I've made in mine. In other words, don't pay attention to my wins to the neglect of my losses because we've had a lot of those. It's wise to learn from your mistakes. It's wiser to learn from the mistakes of others. Let me clean that up and say it a different way. It's wise to learn from experience, but it's wiser to learn from the experience of others. And this is a PT quote. You don't have enough time to make all the mistakes yourself. Learn from somebody else's. Read biographies of successful people. Success wasn't an overnight thing for anybody that's done anything major in life. They had a lot of struggles, just like I've been teaching you in this series. There's a lot of struggles that you've got to go through to get to where you're successful. Be teachable. Be open. Ask God for insight when other people have fallen. Don't kick the man when he's down. Learn more about what put him on the ground. Say, God, what should I learn from this? What do I need to learn from that? Learning from other people's failures is often all about asking the right questions at the right time in the right way. So be corrected by your defeats and learn from other people's mistakes. You know what the problem is here? The reason that I can preach so well and so fast is because I'm in better shape now than I was when I started this thing. I'm, I'm preaching and I ain't hardly even breathing hard up here. I, I just realized I need to add 15 more minutes to my sermons. I believe I can do it. They're like, go get you a ho-ho, preacher. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. Number five, this is where we're going to finish this whole thing up. Be conscious of God's dependability. Joshua chapter 1 is filled with the promises of God. God says over and over, Joshua, you can depend on me. You can count on it. Bet your bottom dollar I'm going to be there. I'm going to take care of you. I am dependable. I found four things that God promises to do for us in this life, just like he did for Joshua in his life. He says, if you'll obey me in every area of your life, I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to honor you with four incredible blessings. And these are incredible. Number one, God promises us his power. Verse five, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. If you obey me, nothing's going to stop you. You will be powerful. Number two, God promises his protection. Verse five, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you, and I will never leave you nor forsake you. God says not only will nothing stop you, but nothing can harm you because I'm going to go before you. I'm going to prepare the way. I will be with you. Number three, God promises prosperity. Verse eight, do not let this book of the new law or of the law depart out of your mouth, but meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I didn't say that. God said it. You'll be successful if you obey the principles in God's word. So does God want every Christian to be a millionaire? No, absolutely not. The Bible's definition of prosperity is this. You ready? Having more than you need. Having more than you need. God promises prosperity, having more than you need. And God says, I guarantee you'll have more than you need. He promises power, protection, and prosperity. And finally, God promises us his presence. He promises us his presence. Verse 9, God will be with you wherever you go. The condition is obedience to everything God calls us to obey in his word. You don't get to pick and choose what part of the Christian lifestyle that God's called us to that we're going to live. You can't just tear out what you don't like. He says, look, my principles are pretty simple, but you've got to live your life by them. And I can summarize that. Lord, what's the greatest commandment? Love God, love people. And you go, well, that's kind of cheap grace. No, it's not. There's some people that are very, very hard to love. Amen? I mean, it takes some work. You've got to figure that out. And, and God says you need to master that. You need to be able to love God and love people. God will be with you wherever you go. Joshua 24, 15 summarizes Joshua's life and why he had incredible success leading God's people into the land of promise. Joshua said, if serving the Lord seems un undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the God of the Amorites in whose land you are dwelling. This is the key to his life. He said, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're all in. We're going to serve God. Joshua says, regardless of what anybody else does. He said, I can't answer for those people that get, you know, that get distracted over here. They hear the noise and see the distraction and they, they get their rows out of line and they're crooked and they're bobbing and weaving. He said, I can't, I can't speak for them. But he said, I'm keeping my eyes on the prize. I'm looking to the author and the finisher of my faith. I'm keeping my eyes on God, the Father, his son, Jesus Christ. And I'm going to live my life for glory and honor him in everything that I do. So regardless of what anybody else does, my family and I will live for God, come what may. We're all in. We're committed. Look, if fathers would become the spiritual heads of their house that God intended for them to be, and they would stand up and say the same thing as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. 
it, it hurts my feelings when I see parents with dependent children at home letting them decide whether or not they're going to go to church. Whether they, go, they get to decide whether or not they want to be in, in the house of the Lord. I'm like, oh, you have no idea. It's inevitable. I've been around long enough to see parents that allowed their children to decide whether or not they was going to participate in faith. And then years later, those same parents are in my office or in an altar somewhere saying, I can't get my children to come to church. You just don't know what a bad life they're living. They're, they're living the life that you allowed them to choose when they were small kids. Oh, that, ooh, I felt a little tug on the line right there. That's a whole sermon series right there. Coming up at Cross Point Church. Train up a child in the way he should go. And be sure to go that way yourself, said Charles Spurgeon. Amen. I'll finish the same way I started since I've ticked about two-thirds of the room off on that child-rearing thing. God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life. God says, here are my promises to everyone who pursues my plan, the dream that I've given you for your life. You will have my power. You will have my protection, my prosperity, and my presence. These promises are provisional. There's a prerequisite that has to be met. He says you've got to obey his commands and follow his plan. God's plans for your life are better than your plans for your life. I challenge you, if you've not opened your life to him, to do it today. Listen to me, folks. Because whenever I, and Sylvia and and anybody that's been around for a little while, they can tell you this is kind of how I roll. But whenever I've got to preach something heavy and there's something that you need to chew on and take out of here, an application, which I've just given you a sermon full of application. Sometimes I'll try to break the tension in the room with a little bit of humor or something just to get you to think about it and not push away from it. But I promise you this. And I want you to focus on what I'm fixing to say. If you walk out of this room today and you've been a part of this six-week journey, this church-wide campaign of small groups and sermon series and us challenging you to become the person God has called you and, and told you you could be, He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And if you push away from it and you've sat through this for six weeks and you go, yeah, I'm just not ready, I don't know how that's going to play out for you somewhere down the line. I, I, I have no idea how long God's going to have a door open for you. He, he, he's always going to have a door, but you, you, if you keep turning it down, you keep walking away from it, you're the one that can deny the door and miss the provision that God's made for your life. And I don't want anybody to miss the promise of God. I want you to, to leave here today and know that you've done all you could to walk in faith and accept the promise, the plan, the provision of God. Don't, don't, please. And I feel an urgency, a compelling urgency. And it's not just some over-spiritualized preacher talk. I'm telling you, all throughout this series, I've been saying it, I feel an urgency for you to lean into faith and to kneel at the cross and surrender your heart and life to God. He has a plan and a purpose for your life. And as long as there's noise and there's distraction and you're not living it, you're living beneath your privileges. But pastor, I got a plan. And if I, if I become a believer... I'm going to have to, you know, set my plans aside. Let me say it one more time. God's plan for your life is bigger than your plan for your life. He has great plans for you, and you need to lean in and believe it. So I'm asking you, if you don't know him, if you don't know him, if you haven't given your heart and your life to Jesus to live your best life in this life, and then prepare for the next one to come, because there's more to life than this life. This isn't all there is. There's more to life than this life. The best is yet to come. It's time to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Every head bowed and every eye closed. We're going to pray sort of a different prayer today. But I'm asking everybody in the room to repeat the prayer after me. And if you're not a believer, but you're ready to take that step, if you've gotten distracted and the rows that you're plowing for your life have gotten to where they bob and weave and it's taking you longer to get successful in your life and you realize God's got a plan and you need to get back on it, then I'm asking you to pray this prayer and get refocused on the author and finisher of your faith. But if you've never allowed him into your heart, this is the time, this is the opportunity to invite him to come into your life so that his plan can be realized. Everybody in the room, pray after me. Heavenly Father, I commit myself to you with no strings attached Because I know your plan for my life is bigger than my plan for my life. So forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart. 
I give my life to you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Listen to me very carefully. Every time that we pray this prayer together, we had four or five people to stand up in the first service, and I believe there's more people that have either recommitted because your rows have gotten a little bobbed and weaved, you know, and some people made new commitments and said, I'm going to get back on track and I'm going to give God my all. And some of those people stood up, and then there were people that stood up for the first time that says, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm putting my eyes on him, the author and finisher of my faith. We give you three opportunities, basically, to make a public confession and not be ashamed of what God has done in your heart and your life. One of them is about to happen right here in this room, where I'll ask you to stand if you prayed that prayer and either recommitted your life or if you made the decision for the very first time to follow Jesus. And we're going to celebrate with you when you stand up. We're going to give you gifts, and we're going to uh, ask you, first of all, to acknowledge it that way, and then we're going to give you a New Believers t-shirt. And then you can do, after all that, you can go public with your faith again by being baptized, as one young man is about to do in the room here today. But don't ever be ashamed of what God's doing in your heart. I don't give a holy hoot what anybody has to say about me when it comes to my faith. It, what matters is that I stand before my God, know that I've done, done the best that I could and that I've honored him with the choices that I've made. So I'm going to ask you to be bold and courageous. Nobody's going to embarrass you. Nobody's putting a microphone in your hand. But if you prayed that prayer and you either recommitted your heart and your life to Jesus today, maybe throughout this journey somewhere along the way, or you prayed that prayer and you've decided to follow him for the very first time, would you right now stand to your feet so we can celebrate you in the room? God bless you. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I see you back there. Amen. I see you. God bless you. Keep standing until they get to you this morning. Amen. Come on, Cross Point. Let's celebrate this. Yeah. Amen. Keep standing until they get to you. There's one right back here. Howard, I know we can't see back there. It's a little dark. There's one over there. Amen. Thank you so much. Yes. Amen. How awesome is that? We love you guys. During this last song, I'm going to ask everybody else in the room to stand. My pastoral staff, we're coming down here to stand in front of the altars. Josh is going to be way over here. Me and Sylvia is going to be right here. Brother G is going to be somewhere along here. And Timbo is going to be on the other side. We've been having so many people come into the VIP room for prayer that have pressing needs. We don't want to miss anybody. During this last song, if there's something that you want us to help you pray about, we're here to pray with you and to believe God for you. Otherwise, let's worship and let's enjoy the flow of God's presence in the room. Be excited about what God is going to do in your life. His plan and his purpose cannot be averted. He's got something for you, and you're stepping into the promise today in Jesus' name. If we can pray for you, come up during this last song and let us do that in Jesus' name.